Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Today, we have a terrific conversation from La Paz, Bolivia with our special guest, Leonardo Flores, who uh, is one of Code Pink's Latin America campaign coordinators and led an election observation delegation to Bolivia starting last Thursday. And he is still there post-election day. Uh, so welcome, Leo. It's Thanks really fun to like be talking to you from La Paz. Absolutely. <laughs> and good to see you. Likewise. So Sunday was, this is kind of fun. I'm in Mexico City and you're in La Paz. This is, <laughs> this is kind of neat for our Latin America team. Um, Sunday was uh, the presidential, Sunday the 18th, was uh, the presidential elections for Bolivia after uh, the world watched a coup in October 2019 and the OAS manipulation of the presidential elections at that time, which basically put an interim right-wing government into power. So tell us, well, first of all, just give us a temperature reading of what it's like on the ground today, post-election, and then let's talk about election day and some of the really intense variables that led up to election day. Right, so it's funny because the TSC, the Bol Bolivia's Le uh, National Electoral Authorities, when they sent uh, the agenda to the, uh, to the observers, they had it on their calendar as th that the observers would leave the Tuesday after the elections. Uh, we thought that was a little strange given that everything that had happened last year, so we decided to try to stay a little longer. In La Paz, things are really calm. It's almost as if, you know, it's total, total normalcy, right? We have gotten reports from Eastern Bolivia of people, you know, protesting the, the results, saying without any basis whatsoever that there was fraud. But these are pretty much small groups. Uh, just yesterday in La Paz, there was a demonstration of about 100 people that mar marched down one of the main avenues here, uh, demanding that the elections results be canceled. Uh, but yeah, again, that was a very small, a very small group of, of protesters, and they have no basis. And they were for, like opposition fraud. right wing protesters. Yeah, opposition yeah. right wing protesters. Uh, but basically, they're saying that the MAS shouldn't have been allowed to run at all because of last year's so-called fraud, uh, which, of course, there was no fraud. Uh, so really, you have this very small sector of Bolivia's population that is very upset at those re these results. But I think the vast majority of the people, and I, I don't just mean the 55 percent that voted for the MAS, but a significant percentage of those who voted for some of the other opposition candidates, uh, they're, they understand the results and they're, they're kind of looking forward to you know, going back to normalcy after a year of a coup regime that was, you know, brutal and authoritarian and committed massive human rights violations. So this, I mean, for all of us sitting here, I can tell you here in Mexico, people were just elated, like tears in our eyes, which I can't, I mean, it was beyond that in, in throughout Bolivia, I'm sure. So for our, our viewers, most of them probably understand what happened last fall but October of 2019 were the uh, presidential elections according to the constitution in that in timely interval. And the vote was very, very close with Evo Morales eking out a slight majority and winning. And what happened after that election? Just as background for our viewers to really understand the, the importance of this past Sunday. Right. So last year they had this system in place called the quick count vote, known as the TREP. Uh, so it's a, a basically a mechanism for publishing preliminary results. That's from the TSC, the nation's electoral authorities. And what happened was that the TREP at one point stopped and then restarted. And then there was a claim that there was fraud because when the TREP stopped, uh, Evo Morales was up by about you know seven or eight points. And then we, when it restarted again, he ended up winning by about 11 points. Uh, and so who, who I, uh, claimed there was fraud with the what entity oh, that, was claiming there was fraud? Okay, sorry. I'll get to that in a second, but I just want to <laughs> okay. give a quick anecdote because last week we met with electoral experts who told me something super interesting. They said that the company that was hired to carry out this trep had to have 80% of the results in by 8 p.m. Well, by 6 p.m. local time, they only had 60% of the results in. 
So what they did was they fed the results from the state of Santa Cruz, which is, which is in Eastern Bolivia, which is an opposition stronghold. They fed those results into the system, thereby skewing the, the very system they were meant to, to, to protect. Wow. And, right? So, so wow. you have all these votes coming in from Santa Cruz, which skewed the results and made it look like the elections were much closer than they were. So then, of course, when you have this last 20% come in, it was skewed heavily towards Morales' base, which is why the lead expanded and why, why Morales, you, you know, went from being up seven to being up 11 or so. And so the day after the elections, or I, it might have been the night of, I would have to check, the OAS issued a statement saying there was something really fishy going on about this TREP system, about the quick count, because prior to the TREP stopping, it looked like it was there was going to be a for sure a second round. In Bolivia, if a candidate takes 40% or more, they have to win by 10, or if they take 50%, uh, they win outright. And if they take 40% or more and win by 10, there's no second round. Otherwise, they go to a second round with the, just the top two candidates. So the OAS issues a statement at a very critical time in Bolivia, allege basically alleging fraud. So immediately, the right wing in Bolivia goes into overdrive saying, no, we can't trust those results, there's fraud. And then for the next several weeks, the country was very tense. And that's when Code Pink really got involved in, in this story in Bolivia, because we were watching it closely. We didn't know what was going to happen. And then we actually started planning to send some folks down to Bolivia and actually Medea Benjamin from Code Pink, uh, Ty Berry, and at, at White Reed came down as well. Uh, but what happened was, you know, the weekend of November 10th, there was hints that there was going to be a coup. That later that week, the OAS was supposed to issue its preliminary report. Mm. It was due, I think, about the 14th or 15th of November. But instead, they issued it five days earlier, and they insisted that there was fraud. So basically, the OAS, what they did was they set this narrative of fraud in the Bolivian media. Bolivian media is really, especially at a national level, is dominated by like corporate right-wing right -wing interests. And so they were the ones yelling fraud. They were backed by the OAS, and the OAS issues this report saying that there was fraud. This report was writ later completely debunked by many, many academics, including from CEPR, the Center for Economic Policy Research, MIT, and many others. So basically the OAS, the day after the elections, they, they question them. And then the day before the coup happens, they issue this report saying it was fraud. So the OAS really has blood on its hands from my point of view, because right after the, the coup that ousted Evo Morales, there were massacres in Sincata, which actually Medea was there to witness uh, the aftermath of. And there was ma massacres in, in Sacaba. And, and there were basically these horrible human rights abuses uh, occurring throughout the country where the military was firing live ammunition on protesters who wanted the results respected. So, wow, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you've mentioned that well, first, I guess, the first thing that comes to mind is is the suspension of the count, the delay, suspension, stopping, um, it's not so much unlike or may actually be exactly like what happened in Honduras in, in their presidential election. Uh, it was at uh, fall of 2017, I think, where there was like a 36 hour delay. And of course the United States recognized the outcome of that, those elections with no no criticism whatsoever. Yeah, and it's my understanding that this delay was actually pre-programmed. Everyone knew they were going to stop at eighty percent, mm -hmm. and then take more a couple more days to do the to, to do the other twenty percent. And so, you know, there's, I mean, it was there was a lot of confusion and a lack of transparency around the whole trip. Uh, this quick count system last year and actually this year they were supposed to have a very similar system in place the difference was that this system was going to be even less transparent than last year's but many of the uh, electoral observers denounced this system including code pink we are among the ones that were questioned it in in front of the tsc we said you know what's going on with the system why are you using a new system that's barely been tested who's auditing the system we actually asked them what companies were auditing the system we knew who they were because we had done some research beforehand but we wanted the tse to confirm it and they gave us the runaround they refused to answer the question and so this it was very kind of you know, something sketchy was definitely going on. And then the night before the elections, they suspended this quick count system in response to all this massive pressure that they received. And yet they did it in a very poor way. So they didn't consult with the parties actually running uh, and they didn't like give their exact reasons why they were canceling it. They just canceled it. And so, I mean, a very typical authoritarian move, uh, not informing and not consulting with, with the people and the parties. Um, but, you know, we're kind of 
in some ways we're glad they did because the system was very, very shady. Uh, who knows what could have happened had this quick count system been in place. So this year on election day, well, first of all, I think you arrived on Thursday of last week, I believe. And what did you, what was the, what was the temperature reading on the ground Thursday? What, what, was, what was the public temperature reading and what sort of things were you observing? Being, yeah, you were so, still basically functioning under a coup government yeah. at that point. And so I think early Thursday morning, I did a quick video uh, of uh, one of the cable cars here in Bolivia mm. and things were pretty normal. But then as the day went on, as we talked to more and more people, you could sense the kind of an underlying tension uh, we were told that people were stocking up on food and on fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, people were kind of nervous. They thought that this week they wouldn't be able to leave their houses. They thought there would be clashes on the street. Uh, and to be honest, going in, that's what we thought too. We thought that going that we'd go to the voting centers and, and like to witness aggressions on the part of particularly the far right trying tr trying to impede the mass vote. Uh, and so that was the kind of the mood last week is one of tension, you know, uh, t underlying tension is what I would say. And so the expectation was no matter what the electoral outcome, there would be protests. Were you expecting that the right wing would push back fit with physical violence, physical aggression, if they did For not sure. win? Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, we I had thought about several, several scenarios as we were coming down. And I thought, you know, if, they, if the Moss wins by 10 or 11 points and it's like 47 to 36 or something like that, or not even, like just you know just over 40 and but by 10 10 points enough to uh, not have a second round then there's going to be you know serious tensions and i would i foresaw clashes but i also thought you know in my wildest of dreams i was like well if the mass amount takes 50 percent then I, that's going to be a very clear sign to everyone in the country and i think things will be calm and luckily that's what's happened you know you have some for, kind of very far right demonstrators protesting these results uh, again, on a completely unfounded basis, but for the most part, it's been calm, and that's been, you know, really, really kind of a a relief, a huge relief, not just you know for everyone in the country. Uh, I, I don't know that anyone expected such a massive mass victory, except for maybe the mass folks who were who themselves were predicting that they would take 53 or so percent of the vote. But even then, even they were a bit skeptical about, you know. Uh, their own uh, methodology because they thought well are we really going to do that much better this time around and they did do that much better and i think part of the reason is that you know you had a lot of people who have vote traditionally voted for the mass who've become disenchanted over the years and thought well you know maybe it's time to alternate and give someone else a shot but when after living through this coup regime for 11 months they saw uh, what neoliberalism brings. They saw what fascism brings. And they said, you know what, let's go with the mass that has brought us 15 years of uninterrupted economic growth, that has brought massive development to this country, that has really brought dignity to a lot of the people in this country and a sense of equality, particularly for indigenous people. And I think they saw that the, the hate being pushed by, mm -hmm. particularly by the Gremos, the far right party led by Fernando Camacho. And so this was an election rejecting hate, rejecting fascism and rejecting neoliberalism. So, uh, do you think uh, the Moss won by it was fifty two point four percent, almost fifty three percent of the vote? Am I correct in that? No. So I mean, right now, it was more 90, than that at this point. Yeah, with about ninety three percent of the official vote counted, the Moss is up with fifty five or fifty four point five six percent of the vote. They are up twenty five points over the next leading wow. candidate. It's huge, amazing, like a huge victory. Do you think that, you know, you mentioned that people realized, you know, they basically made a mistake, uh, you know, according to their own interests last uh, October of 2019. Do you think it was helpful for, for the mosque to have new leadership this time around? A, yeah, a new I face, a new voice to the party? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, let me say Abel won last time. You know, I yeah. think we, we, we kind of forget yeah, that sometimes when it. we talk about yeah. the new leadership. Yeah, Abel won. Uh, in the sense of new leadership, yes. I think the mass themselves have been talking about that, uh, not just not just you know someone else other than Abel, but also just kind of you know raising this new generation of politicians. And so you exactly. have a lot of young people yeah. now in the in the in the in, in the Senate and the Chamber of Dep Deputies. Um, and actually, 20 of the 36 senators are women, which is amazing. Uh, I think the MAS has 21 of the 36 senators. So yeah, I think there's been a very concerted effort by the MAS to, to kind of raise this new generation of political leaders. And additionally, I think they they've now understand, 
I mean, the Mas should have always known, they, they kind of always have known the importance of social movements because really this is a party that grows from social movements. Exactly. Um, and, but I think that was that was kind of lost maybe in over the years as, as the process kind of became maybe a little too centralized. But but now they, they they're talking about leading with the social movements. Uh, and I think that's going to be very key for them to kind of push their agenda and maybe even kind of deepen their process of change. I was talking with someone last week and I mentioned, you know, the coup in, in Venezuela in 2002 and how after that coup, the Boliv Bolivarian revolution really took a left-wing turn and became you know, much more left-wing and eventually became becoming socialist. And I asked if that was possible for the MAS. And they said, well, you know, I don't know what the leaders are gonna do, but certainly that's what the social mo movements are gonna do. We're gonna be pushing more and more for our rights and for, for you know, dignity and equality for all and for socialism as well. I think this is a, let's talk a little bit more about the social movements. And the, one of the things you, you mentioned about younger people now being more involved in the party and actually holding seats in the Senate. And the, it's so important and it's such a fantastic example for all of us to see this development of young people and creating a line of succession for the party ideology, for the economic goals of the country, the political goals, all of that. I and mean, it's a very exciting prospect and it um, creates a lot of positive energy and a really great example for all the rest of us to follow in our own, with our own political parties in our own respective countries. So in that sense, let's talk about the importance of social movements existing first and growing into a party and creating that movement on the ground and power on the ground from the people up versus what we see happens in the United States where there's a lot of movements and those movements get co-opted by the two major political parties. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is that when we talk about the MAS, that's really shorthand. It's MAS dash IPSP. So MAS mm -hmm. is movement towards socialism. IPSP is political instrument for the sovereignty of the peoples. And so really the MAS starts as the IPSP. It was basically a conjunction of social movements, including uh, Evo Morales and his Cocaleros Union. Uh, lots of different unions, they came together, lots of social movements, they came together in about, I think it was 2005, or re just prior to 2005 actually. Uh, and they tried to form their own, you know, they didn't want to quite exactly form a party because they were very skeptical of the whole party system but they did want to run in elections. And so they came together as the IPSP and tried to register as a party with the, uh, in, in front of the TSE, but they were not allowed. And so what happened was that this person, uh, it was basically one guy who owned the MAS party said, you know what, you can have it. And so they were under, able to run under the MAS banner as the MAS IPSP. Uh, and so that's really kind of the kind of the the, the origin story of the MAS IPSP, and, and this reliance on social movements is is really what uh, a it's what allowed Bolivia to kind of overcome these eleven months of, of regime change, mm -hmm. and it's really what's allowed them to to you know uh, be in power and have really it's in, during the most stable period by far in Bolivia's history. We're talking about a country that has about, had about two hundred coups and counter coups. Uh, in its 200 plus years of existence, right? Uh, and so the MAS brought some massive stability, economic growth, lowered inequality, lowered poverty. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and that has a lot to do with the fact that how, to how well connected they were to the social movements, how well they understood Bolivia's problems, uh, ranging from the poorest of the poor to uh, people in the, in, in the cities or, you know, middle class and higher. It's just so, you know, it's so fascinating to, to watch that because for, the, for an elected government to know they have this huge base in civil society that supports them and is giving oxygen to the political movement from the ground up allows the government to also work from the top down for the benefit of the people. And it's that cross fertilization that, that keeps happening. That is, it's such a fantastic example of what's possible. And, and what's needed in so many places. So this major, uh, this fantastic, <laughs> what's the word I wanna use to describe the win on Sunday is so inspiring and so concrete. There's no doubt who the government and what the government is in Bolivia. What message is that sending to the rest of the hemisphere, to the rest of the world and what are the implications 
of the election results. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge message. I think it pot potentially pretends a new pink tide for Latin America, if not a pink wave, because this time around, I think it's going to be de deeper, right? So next year, we have elections in Ecuador, we have elections in mm -hmm. Chile. Uh, and I think, I think the lesson here is that people's power can overcome fascism, can overcome neoliberalism. And I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see unity among the left in Chile and e Ecuador. And then, you know, further down the line, there are going to be elections in uh, Brazil and in Colombia. And if the left can take those as well, which is very possible, particularly in Brazil, but even Colombia, uh, you know, a mm -hmm. country that has, you know, easily the most right wing country in, in Latin America by far uh, over the over at least 100 years, I think there's a strong possibility that the left can win can win there because we're seeing massive protests in Colombia. We're seeing social movements organizing more and more and people's power out on the streets. And, and the lesson from Bolivia is that, you know, you can do it. Uh, you know, if you if you unite, if you work together, if, if you have you build this you know, cross section of different social movements that it really can be overcome. And what we're going to see also in like geopolitically is the rebuilding of, of certain institutions that have been kind of destroyed over the past uh, years, uh, particularly in part due to the due to U.S. imperialism and the policies of Barack Obama and Donald Trump. I'm thinking specifically of UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations. Uh, President-elect Luis Arce has already said that Bolivia is going to take a leading role in rebuilding UNASUR. And I expect also Bolivia to rejoin ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of the Americas, which is, uh, you know, a very, I would call it a, rather than a free trade ag agreement, it's a fair trade agreement. And it's very kind of important uh, for the countries that are in it because it allows kind of a complementary trade where it's win-win rather than just like an open market where it's everyone for themselves. Um, in addition to that, I think we're also seeing a massive rejection of the OAS right now. Uh, you know, so the Grupo de Puebla, the Puebla group, which is made up of, you know, various Latin American leaders, uh, you know, I'm blanking on the right the word I want to say, and not quite high ranking, but prestigious leaders, former presidents, former foreign ministers, uh, former, you know, uh, parliamentarians, they've called for Luis Almagro to resign, echoing the calls made by Code Pink. If you want Luis Almagro to resign, go to www.codepink.org slash OAS and sign our letter. Uh, in addition to the Grupo de Puebla, you've had lots of people criticizing Almagro recently, including the Mexican government, including Evo Morales, uh, including CELAG, which is a think tank in Latin America. You know, so right now is really the time to jump on Luis Almagro because he's got blood on his hands and he's been proven false. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned with regards to last year's elections is that the OAS, after having their main theory debunked about this quick count system, they held on to the fact that there were certain irregularities in in what are they called actas, tally sheets. Right. And well, it turns out that Sieper and Salag and others have compared these tally sheets from last year to this year. And it turns out the mass has either equaled or won the vote, won more of the vote in these particular voting stations than they did previously. So, so that, that completely undercuts any OAS argument about, about fraud in 2019. And the OAS really needs to be held accountable. I hope to see a push in Congress uh, holding them to account. And really, I, I think we're going to see a push throughout Latin America kind of rejecting Luis Almagro's leadership. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> so I, the petition, the Code Pink petition is, is fantastic. And the Puebla group um, statement or basically demand that he step down is, is a really uh, powerful thing to be witnessing now as well. I wanted to um, ask you about, um, well, I, I guess one thing I want to say just while I'm thinking about it, you mentioned CEPR, which for our viewers is the Center for Economic Policy and Research, and they can be found at CEPR.net. And they have some, like, I think they produce some of the first reports after October 19th um, elections, and you can find their findings at CEPR.net. And then what I wanted to ask you about, we're also on the heels of the CEPR reporting, we had um, the MIT uh, analysis of last year's elections as well. So there's plenty of data yeah. to really push for a leadership change in the, in the OAS. Absolutely. Yeah, there's been many, I think there's been seven studies total debunking this OAS uh, report from 2019. No, it's really a matter of not only debunking Almagro, but the entire institution. <laughs> Which, yeah. yeah, so, uh, so what, else, what else should we talk about while I have your time? I know you're super busy. Is there anything that, uh, that we've missed? 
Oh, you know, I, I would, I think we should maybe talk a little bit about um, some of the aggression against one of the um, journalists traveling with yeah. you. So not just one, really. From the day we arrived, several members of our delegation had their pictures taken and, and posted online, and they received threats online. And then the interior minister, Arturo Murillo, who's really the one responsible for the massacres of Sacnata Zacaba, he tweeted very ominously that we know where you are, we know what you're eating, and he threatened to put people on a plane. And really threatening to put people on a plane when you're in South America has very kind of uh, dangerous undertones because it, you know, harkens back to Plan Condor, yeah. the dictatorships of the 70s where people were put on planes and then thrown off planes and just disappeared. Yeah. And then there were aggressions against the Spanish delegation. The Argentinian delegation came and an Argentinian parliamentarian was almost basically disappeared. He was briefly detained. An Argentinian diplomat was beat up. And then just yesterday, there was a press conference where our own Alina Duarte was threatened by the interior ministry. Uh, you know, and if an international observers are treated like this by a coup regime, you can just imagine how normal everyday Bolivians are treated by their own coup government. Uh, but luckily, I think that the issue with Alina is is not as serious as we thought, but we're still taking precautions uh, with her, of, of course. Oh, that's that's good news. I mean, it's amazing how brazen in front of the world and on camera that these people are. I mean, it's just such a pure example of of the arrogance and, and the presumption of power that they have. And it's just so wonderful to see the people of Bolivia prevail. And it's such a wonderful message of hope um, for, the, for the rest of us, for the hemisphere and for the rest of the world. So Leo, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know you've been so busy and um, the days have been very long but I'm so happy you were able to make uh, some time for us today. Of course. I'm so yeah. sorry we couldn't do it live yesterday because of some tech difficulties. <laughs> well, you know, so much, Terry. this happens and thank you so much. And we look forward to, to talking with you when you get back home. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.